narrative of not wanting to come to this city is gone. You know, like I think that's old and we should move past that. Believe in the city, believe in yourselves. Who's in the shadows? Who's ready to play? Are we the hunters? Or are we the prey? Toronto, Canada. Enough with the insecurities. We are world class. Let me tell you something. Forget that he left and he left and that he left too. They couldn't what we wanted, what we deserved. Hold them accountable for what they left behind. But then, please, this could be the ground this far. We came this far to go further. A true winner seeks growth. It's the journey. It's the quest called greatness. If we want to be the best, then risks need to be taken. Feelings get hurt. People may leave. So, welcome everybody. Welcome. We're late. I know. It should seem like that's just Simone's MO, right? late all the time but listen it's for good reason it's my first time back and there's been a lot of changes since the last in the now and i'm very happy to be relaunching this show on my tcn tv network and i'm very happy to those who are viewing and who will be viewing for your support thank you for giving me the support that i need and honestly definitely just keeping me going so i wanted to start with the raptors for a few reasons because this show with the relaunch i'm going to be doing things a little bit different uh yes i'm going to be giving you guys obviously my my community you're going to be getting news from around the diaspora that's important that you guys know what's going on with each so we know what's going on with each other so we can kind of stay in tune but obviously i'm also going to be giving stories that are interesting things that i find kind of funny things that i find scary like glass bridges things like that that we'll be talking about later and of course sometimes talking about things that are not too great but the best thing about this launch is I'm going to be starting a whole new segment, which will be the last 20 minutes of the show. And this is going to be called In Tune with the Universe. And I'm going to have guests who will come on. And these guests are going to be sharing with us how they became in tune with themselves, which allowed them to finally, obviously, start living their purpose. Because it's a different lifestyle when you're living your purpose than when you're just existing. And it's definitely something I want to share it's going to be almost like uh, a video um, think, think and go rich. Yeah. But it's going to be called In Tune with the Universe. And it's going to have all of us in the diaspora speaking and talking about how we got to where we were because we connected and listened to ourselves and went along with what was supposed to be good for us. So I'm excited about that. So I want to say something about that video. So one thing that I heard is, and I think it's it stuck out, is people may leave, but that's okay. So... Obviously, you guys know the Raptors are killing it. Like we, and I was saying, I was sharing with the ladies actually in the studio today, who I'm going to get to in a minute, that it's a really good story for even um, our younger people to really look at. This franchise is 24 years old, and it's only now, after 24 years, after people giving up on them, after people saying, oh my God, how, after us losing people, we're like, oh my God, how could we lose you? We're never going to do good now. After all of that, after the turmoil, after the losses, they managed to pull off something that is only, can only be seen as incredible. And they're in the finals now. They've won their first game. And I really want people to understand that that didn't just happen by chance. That's a lot of perseverance, a lot of listening to the naysayers and saying, I don't care what you say. Listening to people who, you know, bandwagon jumpers, one minute they're with you, next minute they're not. Going through all of that and coming through, honestly, Raptors, I applaud you. So I want to introduce, um, obviously you guys know what the changes we've had. We have a new production manager, and she is doing a wonderful job. I love the fact that we're bringing in young talent in here to work with us because it definitely gives us a, a chance and gives me a chance to work with them and, and mentor and learn from them as well because there's some things that I just don't know that she can teach me because she's so much younger. Um, I'd like to welcome Miss Selena McCallum to In The Now because she's never done this show and she's going to realize how hectic it truly is. So we'll see how she does the first time around. We'll be watching you, Selena, but thank you and big up yourself. And 
we have my In Tune with the Universe guest who will be coming on in the last two segments. But because I have news to tell you, let me get on this now because I'm already behind. So let's see. I'm not going to go into too much of the Raptors because uh, I'm not going to drag on about it. But I do want to talk about them for a little bit. Okay, so a couple things. I guess these are just some facts for those who don't know. You bag, bagging, bagging, bandwagon jumpers. So... They were founded in 1995, and they've won six division titles and have made the playoffs 11 times. So after the Vancouver Grizzlies moved to Memphis in 2001, the Raptors became the only Canadian team in the NBA. And you know we've had some star players. We've had Damon Stoudemire. We've had, obviously, the great Vince Carter, his era. Chris Bosh, Kyle Lowry now, who's been holding it down. DeMar DeRozan, obviously, who we lost, and now Kawhi Leonard. In 2017 and 18, the Raptors finished atop the Eastern Conference. And of course, they didn't go all the way through, but it doesn't matter. Again, we're here now. So I don't want to talk about that. So did you guys know that there was a team called the Huskies? Do you have that little ad there that we can show them? Show them this, this ad. <laughs> Let's talk about the shorts. <laughs> Why are their shorts so tight? Oh my gosh. So these were called the Toronto Huskies and they were the Toronto's first professional basketball team. So they were part of the Basketball Association of America, which was the forerunner of the NBA. So the Toronto hosted the league's very first game in November 1946, and that was against the New York Knickerbockers. If you guys remember them. Yeah, that was a long time ago. So many of us weren't even around for that. But just again, to give a little bit of history, uh, let's see when they were actually naming the Raptors, this was, I remember, and I remember this too, the fans were actually given a chance to vote on it, right? So they had 10 options. They had the Beavers, the Bobcats, the Dragons, the Grizzly, the Hogs, thank God, they didn't choose the Hogs, the Scorpions, T-Rex, <laughs> where did they even get these names from? And then the Raptors. So Many of you may know that during, uh, in like 1993, the movie Jurassic Park came out. So this is how Toronto decided on the Raptors. They were going with that whole Jurassic Park theme. Not sure why, but it is what it is. And now it is history. So on May 15th, the team's moniker, the Toronto Raptors, was unveiled on national television. So that was actually this month, 24 years ago. And the associated logo was revealed a few days later. So the person who invented basketball, Mr. James Naismith, for those younger ones who may not know, this is who he is. Um, he invented basketball in, in 1891. That's what they said. That's what's been said, that he invented basketball. So despite the struggles that people do go through, uh, despite things that you may have to face, one thing I think we should all take from the Raptors' rise is that you can still do it and you can conquer. So their next game. Sunday, June 2nd, 8 o'clock p.m. I'm sure you guys will all be there. And I believe it's home. It's home, right? Selena, do you know? You don't know. You don't follow basketball. I asked. It's home. It's home. And you missed it last night, girl. So really quick before we go on break, I want to talk about um, some African-American history. So this is American history. And we're talking about today is actually... Was it May? This month. So this month, not necessarily today, but this month, the magazine Essence. Do you guys remember Essence? So this is one of the older copies. They celebrate their 49 years of blackness, culture, and excellence. So founded in 1968, Essence Communications, Inc. launched Essence, the groundbreaking magazine created exclusively for African-American women's african-american women i can't talk today like honestly but you guys should know if you'd watch my old ones i'm always stumbling over my words anyways so essence as you guys may know yeah let's throw up a few more of these um i remember this when i was younger these were the ones the ones i would look at they had beautiful women on it it was us uh the one thing that many may not know is that this actually was owned it had white ownership for a while and most recently, and I mean recently as in January 2018, Essence announced that it has been completely acquired by Essence Ventures, which the company focused on building content, community, and commerce for women of color. As part of the new deal, Essence President Michelle Ebanks continued in her role and joined its board of directors. So 
it's now a black female-led executive team that is in charge of Essence magazine. So that's pretty cool. And I think I have a picture of Michelle Ebanks there as well, I believe. Yeah. There she is. Incredible things, people. Incredible things. So we've touched Toronto. We've gone over to the States. When I come back, this is where I bring some of the interesting news for you guys. We're going to talk about, and I have a video because you guys wouldn't believe it. We're actually going to talk about a 518 meter long bridge made out of special glass. You guys can give me your comments when we come back on the, you would even cross that. I'll see you guys soon on In The Now. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit benjaminlaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity and our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties team, powered by Remax West. Selena, welcome back everybody to In The Now. So if you're just joining me, we're actually on the relaunch of In The Now. And I just finished my very first segment where we discussed the Toronto Raptors, their comeback story a little bit, where they came from, the fact that they were even considering naming our team the Hogs. I don't know what that t-shirt would have looked like. Who would even wear that jersey? Um, and we were talking about Essence Magazine, how they are now completely black owned and it's all women execs, which is awesome. Very, very excited. Yes, she's so pretty. All right, so let's talk about that glass, that glass bridge we just saw that I would never, ever go on. So have you ever wondered what it feels like walking on air? No, I'm gonna answer that for them, okay? So crossing this glass bridge in China might be the closest you'll ever come to this sensation. The world's largest glass bridge was opened to the public at Hui, which I'm probably said incorrectly, World Adventure Park in East China's lowest, oh sorry, East China's province, and I think it's called Wow. So, Selena, you're gonna help me with this. It's J I A N G S U. How do you think that's pronounced? A I A N G S U. J U. I'm gonna go with it. So that's what Selena's saying. I'm gonna go with it. Earlier this year, and hanging more than 100 meters over 300 feet, three, sorry, 100 to 300 meters over the ground or over ground level. Can you guys even imagine what that would be like? So according to Rupley, the 518 meter long bridge has been made with special glass with a thickness of 3.5 centimeters. I don't care what glass you have, I'm not doing it. 3.5 centimeters, how thick is that, like this? Probably, yeah. yeah, like that. <sighs> So each pane of this glass can hold a maximum of 4.7 tons and the bridge can support 2,600 people at one time. So this little glass, it's like this, can hold 2,600 people at one time. What makes the experience even scarier 
is the sound and visual effect of glass shattering. What? Okay, done with the story. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm over the story. I didn't even see this part of it. Glass shattering. So when you're walking, it feels like it's cracking. People don't love life, eh? They, they clearly don't love life. I'm good. So again, if this is something you guys can let me know and leave it in the comments. And do a little bit of research on this. Would you walk on this thing? Like, would you cross this bridge? Just I know that some adrenaline junkies out there are like, yes, I would do it. I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I drive on the 401. That's enough for me. Like, that's pretty terrorizing for me every day. So I'm good with glass. So let's move on to another story that. <laughs> so there's a designer. Um, let me pull up this picture. We'll pull it up a few times so people can see. These are pretty cool looking ceramics, right? Would you agree? It's kind of cool. You know, they look very like. They could have some African, like, there's something about them that's kind of like, I liked them when I saw them until I found out what they were made out of. So these are actually made out of urine. Yeah. So ceramics is an ancient industry going back about a thousand years. And humans have been glazing their ceramics since as far back as the 8th century BCE. While early civilization used mixes of ash or soda and sand to glaze, Today, most glazing is done with the help of glass and oxide mixes, or sometimes even lead. So, there are some drawbacks to using these glazing materials. The metal and lead glazes are often harmful for the environment. When glazed ceramics are used as utensils, they can, be potential, they can actually leak into your food and your drinks and can cause metal can um, cancering, poisoning, which could probably cause cancer too. So, a designer is exploring a more sustainable option for ceramic glazing. Sine Kim has developed a way to glaze ceramics with the help of human urine. So here's my problem here. This is my problem with this story. If the lead can seep into your food, does this mean <laughs> that urine might seep into my food if I use this? Should I really wanna put like a hot liquid in here so I can be drinking hot peppermint urine tea? Is this what's happening right now? I love the idea and the creativity, but like, is this practical? I, I don't know. So the results she found were remarkable. Since material found in urine are the same materials that can be found in some glazes and clays, they transformed into a glossy opaque coating on the ceramic surface. Kim has glazed tiles and pots with urine to show its potential in being a more sustainable and less hazardous glazing material. So what do you think of this, guys? Again, leave something in the comments. Would you use a ceramic pot made from urine? You know what? And listen, OK. So here's a, here's perspective, because I'm just being facetious here. But what if you were spiritual? Because some people think urine is a very spiritual thing, right? It's supposed to be very like cleansing the ammonia in there. So what if that was for like something spiritual? Would you use it that for like a spiritual ceremony, maybe? But drinking it? I don't think so. Sorry, guys. I'm not there. But I thought the story was kind of interesting, so I wanted to bring it up. So the very last thing we're going to talk about today is uh, something that's not great news, but I feel that it needs to be acknowledged. Uh, so on May 31st, 1921, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, erupted into the most destructive race riot the country has ever experienced. Violence broke out after angry mobs of whites called for the lynching of 19-year-old Dick Rowland after he was wrongfully accused of raping white elevator attendant Sarah Page and thus started the Tulsa race riot. So the issue with this, so the Greenwood District was home to the wealthiest African-American community in the United States, often referred to as Black Wall Street. Yeah, that was right in the middle of everything happening. It's very... It's, yeah, this is not a good story at all. During the two days of violence, the Greenwood District was burnt to the ground. And I mean, this was a fully functional, everything that our community speaks about wanting to do has already been done. This was done and it was done beautifully. And because of the ugly times, we lost such a great moniker of what things can look like. They had their own doctors, they had their own lawyers, they had their own fire station, they had their own movie theaters. I mean, they were doing it. And then after this, so in 1997, after a decade of denials, a state commission launched an official investigation into the incident in 2001. 
and they issued a report which determined that the reparations should be paid to the remaining riot survivors. So again, it's always the afterthought which is the most frustrating with this. Um, I don't know why it took till 1997 and why it took decades to realize that something unjust had been done, but this is usually the case when it comes to us as a community is that, and people say, oh, you know, we need to stop talking about it, but we can't because although they may not be burning down our villages or our cities or our areas where, where we're in a lot right now, they have found other systemic ways to do the exact same thing. So understand that First of all, we have the ability to do great things. We have the ability to have a community that is us, that is governed by us, that is politically driven by us, where the money is flowing within us. It's possible because it's already been done. The blueprint is there. And we're even talking before that. We're talking Marcus Gar like That's a whole other story. Maybe I should just do a show on that. But I want us to at least honor and respect the fact that today is the day that that race war started. It's an ugly part of our past, but it's something that we need to understand, learn from, and know that we can follow what's been set before us and do it again. It's possible. So the exciting part, the news part's done. And when I come back, I'm going to have a very special guest who I'm actually going to tell the story about her. This young lady kept coming back because again I had to get in tune with the universe to really set myself up for this interview. We'll see you soon on In The Now. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt. But your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit BenjaminLaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity and our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties team, powered by Remax West. So I'd like to welcome everybody back and I'd like to welcome you to my very first segment of In Tune with the Universe. And I have a beautiful sister beside me, got all types of good energy. Let me introduce her properly, trust me. She has all type of professional write-up. <laughs> Let me do this properly, hold on. So, Ms. Zalika Reed, is it Benta? is a Toronto-based writer whose work has appeared on CBC Books, in TOK, Writing the New Toronto, and in Apogee, I hope I said that right, journal. In 2011, George Elliott Clark recommended her as the writer to watch. She received an MFA in fiction from Columbia University in 2014, and is an alumnus of the 2017 Banff Writing Studio. She completed a double major 
in English literature and cinema and a minor in Caribbean studies at the University of Toronto. So you know she's well stush. All these universities Toronto. I'm in my feelings. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm trying, to, trying to read this seriously. Let me go back to the introduction. So she also studied creative writing at U of T School of Continuing Studies. And she's currently working on a young adult fantasy, which we're going to go into with her. Maybe we'll get a little bit out of her about it. Drawing inspiration from Jamaican folklore and Akan spirituality. I would like to welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you, Ms. Zalika Reed Benta, to In the Now What's the name of my sh this part of my show, girl? In Tune with the Universe. <laughs> you see, girl, she remembered. Welcome. Hey, Welcome. Thank you. thank you. You know what? So our story, how we connected, is interesting. We were sort of talking about it earlier. So Trish, um, we all know who Trish is, Miss, Miss Trish Browning, had introduced the book to me via email. And I get so many book reviews. I mean, sometimes I'm just like, I have a special cubby for them. That I'm like, you know what, I'll draw it again if I need to get to something. And this is just my, my truth. And I pushed it there. And I have a wonderful sister in Winnipeg. We love you. We both love you. We really she, do. You are so awesome. This is <laughs> Alexia. She sent MC Woke for those online Instagram. It's MC Woke. She sent me uh, an inbox or sorry, a direct message saying, look, girl, I have a sister in, um, in Toronto that I think you need to connect with. And she just wrote a book. And that same book. Pop back up in my face again. I'm like, hmm, okay, 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 I'll get to it, okay. So I kind of just put it aside again. I was like, okay, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And then I went to an event last weekend at, the different, at a different book list on Bathurst Street. And as I'm walking through the bookstore, what do I see? Bam, same book again, in my face. So I was like, okay, universe, all right, I'll stop. What do you want me to do with this book? And what did I need to do? I needed to bring you in because you are a beautiful soul and you're doing wonderful work. Thank you. So talk to me, what does literary success look like for you? With like, how did this happen? Well, um, in terms of how this happened, I always say that the first story it, like there's the story called the building blocks which i say is like the forerunner to the collection because it didn't make it into the collection and i wrote mm. it in like grade 12 writers craft class mm. um and um and then i worked on it a bit in undergrad and the mentors that i was having at the time they were just kind of like i think you have something here i think that you really want to tell a story here so i think you should pursue it and um so then i wrote a, another story in undergrad which is now called frying plantain and it went through like so many different titles it was like fresh it was plastic because of the plastic <laughs> on the grandmother's couch it was like oh, wow. it was so many different things until I settled on Brian Plantin and I wrote that in undergrad and then I used that to actually um as my uh, application to get into my MFA program and then I got accepted and I wrote the collection or a bulk of the collection while I was doing my two years there okay. but then that was like 90 pages and nobody really wants to publish like 90, 90 pages, pages. Yeah. um but i was really frustrated with like not getting um any agents or publishers because i'd worked on the collection for a really long time and i just wanted to be done yeah. um and so i ended up just putting this collection away for a while and then started working on the young adult fantasy novel and um I wasn't used to working on stories without a workshop. So when I was back in Toronto after I finished my MFA, I had one of my um, old mentors, Evie Caslick, read my like 60 pages at the time of my young adult novel. And she was just like, yeah, this is really great. Here are a few things, but what's happening with your short story collection? Cause you know, I, I, I think I really want to see that on bookshelves. And so I was like, huh, right. That story that I like put away for how many years. <laughs> right. um, and that's when I decided to submit it to the Banff Writer Studio. Um, and then I got accepted to the Banff Writer Studio. And then I wrote about four or five more stories a month after I got back from the Banff Writer Studio and sort of fleshed out the collection. And that's how, that's how I got here. That's it. Yes. Um, but in terms of literary success, actually, I mean, the book officially hasn't come out yet. The official launch date is uh, June 4th, but I've had people online look at it. Um, I even went to The Real Jerk the other day and uh, Lily, the owner, like read the first page and she howled. 
And so I think for me, it's like on Twitter, on Instagram, when people are like, this title speaks to my soul. Mm -hmm. Or they're like, I really, I completely understand uh, what uh, my protagonist Kara is going through. That's success for me. I really love it when other people from the diaspora can just be like, I know this story. Yeah, like I relate to it. Yeah, so. And connect to it. Exactly. So, is any of this you? <laughs> Everyone asks me that. I cause like <laughs> it's so it's so like there's very personal things in this. I know when someone's writing from personal experience. No, okay. I, some of this is you. Some of it is me in terms of like Kara loves Plantin and I love Plantin. Who don't love Plantin? No. <laughs> exactly. Plantin over everything. Um but like I lived in the same neighborhoods that she lived in and type of stuff like that. And like um so like a lot of the locations are based on locations that I've been in. Like there's okay. um a story that takes place in a specific um, fast food place called New Orleans Donuts that's like Vaughn and Oakwood that's not there anymore. Um, and what happened in that restaurant didn't actually happen to me, but I do remember one time I like skipped school with my friends to like go to that restaurant and my French teacher saw me and like told my mother. And to this day, my mother still brings it up. So I was just like, I guess I should write something just that takes place in that. Uh, yeah, so like that kind of thing. And like in terms of like characters, I mean, who doesn't know a woman like Nana? Like who, <laughs> who doesn't? Everyone has a Nana in their family. <laughs> so it's just like, it's just composites of like maybe even women that I just saw on the street um, type of thing or like friends. Uh, grandmothers or, or mothers and stuff like that and like maybe a line here or there is okay. like based on reality like one time my mom forgot the age I was and I put that in the story because she was like what? how does she know that you're like 14 I'm like I'm 16 yeah. years old I don't know what you're talking about so like stuff like that okay, <laughs> to make your parents so well that kind of answers my next question was like how well, the research that she put into this like how much research did you actually do to start the... I'm hearing now this process was very lengthy. Yeah. How long would you say this process for this book was? I would say about 10 years. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's nuts because just the idea of writing books seems so difficult. Yeah. What, what are some thoughts for... Before we go into our next segment, because when we go into our next segment, I'm gonna, I really want to touch on what you're going to be doing or how you feel about this book and the launch and how it's going to be. But... Uh, what would be like maybe a piece of advice that you'd give to someone who's looking into writing a book? What's something that they should not do? Well, I mean, we were talking about this before. Like, if you, if you want to write a book, then you can write a book. But I think people have this idea that it's like a completely linear process, and it's not. Like, you sometimes have to take time away. Like, I took two to three years away from my book, and I think that you can't beat yourself up about that for how long it actually takes because people kind of, I think, assume... Yeah, I can write it in a year. I mean, some people, some very lucky people have done that. <laughs> but it's generally a process that takes like 10 plus years. And so, uh, and because like, I remember one of my mentors says, you're said he like, you're going to write your book three times. You're going to write it now, then you're going to edit it, and then you're going to edit the edit. And so it took me a really long time to make peace with that because yeah. I wanted it to be done. Yeah. Um, but so I guess my advice, my like roundabout way is just like, it's okay to take your time. It's okay to write whenever you can. It's okay to write like on your phone, on the bus. It's okay to write like have a Word document and just kind of write your ideas down. And then when it comes together, it comes together. You do have to be persistent, but that doesn't mean that you you're doing something wrong if you don't have like a 300 page book at the end of a year. Okay. So just don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. Basically. Don't feel bad. Okay. So when we come back, we're going to go into, I want to talk about some of the, the chapter titles with you. All right. And the book again is Frying Plantain and that's Miss Zalika Reed Benet Benta. Benetta. What is wrong with me? <laughs> Guys, we'll be back on In the Now. I love it. At Benjamin Law, we understand the real cost of personal injuries. As the victim of an accident, you may be the one who's physically hurt, but your main concern is that your family are the ones who will pay the price. Benjamin Law will be there for you, helping, supporting, and working tirelessly to resolve your personal injury case. Call 1-855-899-4878 or visit BenjaminLaw.ca and let our family of lawyers help your family. Are you retiring smart? 
Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity and our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by Remax West. Welcome back everybody. Welcome back to In The Now and our special segment In Tune With The Universe. And I'm sitting down with Ms. Zalika Reed Benta. And we're talking about her book, Frying Plantain, which I want right now, I'm so hungry. Every time I say it, I feel like I didn't eat. <laughs> so I'm starving and I want some. My mom makes the best fried plantain. And she does it with saltfish and sometimes she makes fried potato or fried dumpling with it. Guys, you have no idea the food, sorry. So let's talk about some of these we were, I was kind of leafing through this um, when we were on break, and I grabbed some titles because I just want to see the moments in your character's life. So chapter one, the very first chapter is called Pig Head. And it talks about <laughs> this young lady opening up the freezer door and seeing a pig's head. Is this story true? Is this part of your life true? Okay, this that's part. That part's this one's true. true. That part's true. That this part's one true. That's seems true. true. I was like, this sounds like something that happened to her. Like, that did happen. This character seems very traumatized. Like, okay, talk to me about pig head. Let's start there. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, to clarify, what happened was when I was in Jamaica, I didn't see an actual pig head. I just saw the blood on, like, the ting and everything. And I was like, where did this blood come from? <laughs> And then that's when, like, my cousins were, like, the big head, and I was like, what? Um, but in terms of titles, I'm terrible at titles. Um, I'm really bad. So for the longest time, I write a story with a placeholder name, and for a while it was Pighead, and I was changing it to other um, names, like what happened in Hanover. In fact, on Apogee Journal, because um, that's the story that got published in Apogee. I think it is called What Happened in Hanover. Okay. And then there's another one where I said, like, playground stories or something like that. And then um, one of my mentors, Victor Laval, was just like, why don't you just leave it as Pighead? And I was just like, isn't that kind of on the nose? It's like, it starts with the Pighead. A lot of it is about the Pighead. Um, and, like, the Pighead is, like, all these different symbolic meetings of like, you know, how she tries to front with her neighborhood friends and how she sort of like, you know, exotifies herself with the, like her white classmates. And it means all these different things. Just name it Pighead. And I was like, okay. Um, it kind of reminded me, there was like the story, um, Snakes on the Plane, yes. where like, they wanted to call it something else. Something else and Samuel right. Jackson was like, there's snakes on a but plane. But there's snakes on the plane. So just call it snakes on the plane. So I was like, okay. So that's that's how Pighead came to came okay. to. Okay. All right. Fia Kitty. All right. So like, um, <laughs> okay. So Fia Kitty. Um, it's not Fia. It's Fia. Oh, Fia. <laughs> so how would Fia be spelled? Oh. You know what? You can spell it the same way, true. Right? Yeah. Or maybe we can add a Y? Yeah, I think so. Maybe. We're going to have to ask the, our parents. <laughs> How do you spell Fia? <laughs> Mom, that's a question for you. Any Jamaicans out there? Put that in the comments. Okay, so Fia Kitty. All right. What that is this actually about? just came from my grandmother because she was just like, yeah, they used to call me Fia Kitty. And I was like, <laughs> that is the most amazing nickname. And wow. I don't know what the story is going to be about, but I'm going to name a story after that like one title. That's hilarious. So yeah, that was one of the last stories that actually got added to the collection because I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just know that that title is going to be there some way. And then my favorite, I found another one. I changed my mind. I had another one picked originally. Drunk. Um, drunk. I was actually just kind of thinking about the conversation I had with my mentor about Pighead because drunk is sort of the story where Kara gets drunk for the first time with like her white friends at a very like one of the more prestigious schools and she comes home drunk and it causes issues with uh, with her mother and it also just like speaks to um, I mean it speaks to different things because when she's getting drunk um, at her at her friend's house, 
you know, they're asking her all these different questions, like, what's a weave? And don't you smoke weed because you're Jamaican? And like all these different <laughs> things. And um, I was just kind of like, uh, uh, I think that, I mean, it's sort of like a whole, like, I feel like even when she's sober, she's drunk throughout the entire thing, or she wants to be drunk because she wants to like survive right. um, this, this part of high school. So I just decided to, to be very blunt with it. Uh, that's like the one thing or like one of the many things that I learned by my from my mentors is just kind of like just just say what it is and just so, put it out there yeah okay so what is the experience if you're gonna because I think one of the reasons why I know for sure I'm gonna dig into this book is because it does touch on the fact that as second generation Jamaicans sometimes we're stuck right like what are we <laughs> <laughs> right um, is that the experience that she has, your character has through this book? Yeah, because, um, you know, I was thinking about it and I wanted, I really wanted to write about third culture kids. I really wanted to write about kids in, in the diaspora or like growing up in the diaspora and how you're not one thing but you're not the other thing, so does that make you something else? And um, you relate to one culture in this case she relates to her Jamaican culture more than her Canadian culture but she's still not exactly Jamaican and so and like that was just something that uh, my friends and myself contended with a lot mm -hmm. growing up um, especially in Toronto yes uh, and I just I really wanted to capture that experience because everything that I had read had been about like you know coming to the states or coming to England or coming to to Canada and sort of just having to deal with um, parents being of a different generation and different um, culture which which is there in the story but because they're like the first ones born in the country um, it, it's a different experience than when if you're like the second generation born yeah. and so you know you you're you're still a little bit more Canadian than like your parents but then like you still grow up like having cornmeal porridge and like you know and banana, having banana yeah. porridge, <laughs> bun and cheese and Mon everything. And cheese. Like, so um, and and yeah, so I just really wanted to deal with that. And also like when I grew up in certain places, like when I was at Eglinton, Weston, Marley, like when I lived around there and went to school around there, being Canadian was like the worst thing. Like you didn't want to be Canadian; you wanted to be something else. And yeah. so I really wanted yes. to get that. Um, get that in as well. Honestly, and this is why I do want to look at this because it is an experience, man. Yeah. Like, you're not accepted by Jamaicans. You're not Jamaican, you're Canadian. Yes. You're not accepted fully by Canadian because they ask these stupid questions like, you're Jamaican, look, all Jamaicans smoke weed. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's so weird because I like it's true there's this like limbo that you live in. Yeah. And I think that this book is going to definitely explore that limbo and yes. kind of like, I, th I know I'm going to be able to relate. I know. I already know. Like, frying plantain, I'm hungry. <laughs> Did I mention this already, that I was hungry? So, talk about, let's talk about uh, some of the difficulties you had with this book. Like, yes, I know you'd put it aside, but even, like, with starting it again and publishing it, did you have any difficulties going through that process? Or was that relatively smooth for you? Well, the thing about it is like the one thing you hear all the time is that nobody wants to publish short story collections because they don't sell or they don't make money. Okay. And so, um, so you're like, yeah, you hear that um, from agents, you hear that when you're in your like academia, MFA programs. And so like, yeah, you kind of go in just being like, is anyone really gonna wanna read this? Does anyone yeah. really wanna like acquire it? Because I keep hearing that short story collections don't sell um mm. so that was in the back of my mind and i sort of um when i spoke to my mentor again who said like i think you should go back to it i i think because i took time off and i wasn't so green like i it wasn't just out of school being like i want to get this published and i took some time i kind of had this attitude where i was like you know what i'm gonna just send things out I'm just gonna send it out and see what happens. Yeah. So that's what I did, and um, and while I was at Banff, I got interest. And so when I was actually at a writing residency, I didn't do a lot of actual writing. I asked a lot of business questions to the established writers that were around because I was like, I didn't actually expect any interest. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they were just like, I think you should get an agent because I was doing this all by myself. And so then I reached out to my current agent, um, and 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 then like she loved it and away we went um but it's definitely difficult and i had to like 
I mean, I had to get an MFA first and I had to go to a writing residency first and I had to have interest first before I could get sort of represented. Um, mm. So there's definitely like hurdles for sure. Yeah. Um, like, cause uh, I work with, uh, I run um, writing mentorships for, for an organization. So the first thing, one of the things I talk to the mentees about is, you know, they really want to see that you're serious about your craft. So the fact that you're in a mentorship or even if you have a writing group or even if you like anything to show that you're really serious about your craft, um, that will that will definitely help your chances. Help you yeah. So in terms of like the business side, that was sort of like my process in terms of writing. <laughs> I, you guys missed the eye roll. You didn't see the eye roll. You probably could see the camera's not that sharp. There was an eye roll there. Wow. Um, just because, like, a lot of people couldn't get through the potwa. Um, just, like, a lot mm. of people were just kind of like, I just don't know what this person is saying. I don't know how to get through to it. And so I spent a lot of time just kind of tweaking the dialogue because I oh didn't my. want it to be... Because, like, when I first wrote it, I kind of used um, poetry by uh, Linton Questy Johnson um, as sort of, like, a map. And he writes, like, pure. Like, it's just... It's it's straight. And so I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can soften it a little bit uh, without sort of giving everything away. So it just became, like, a process of... of uh, trying to get like the cadence and, and still writing certain things a certain way like right. and um and not take away from it yeah exactly yeah because so, there's certain things you just can't translate exactly so i was trying <laughs> to do that so that was like the biggest the biggest hurdle with my uh with my collection and i hope I did it well. Like, I am very nervous of, like, Jamaicans, like, reading it because I'm just, like, I know that's not how you spell. Like, I know, like, it's can't. Like, I know it's not canna. I know it's can't. But I have to, like, you know, do certain things to, to let other people read, read it. it. Um, yeah, like, so. like fear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is the other thing, like, putting it on paper. Like, you can hear it a certain way, but then you're, like, how, how, how does am it I going to look? look? How's how? It? Yeah, exactly. How does it look when you're trying to pronounce it? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about the future for you before we, we end. What does, I know this launches June 4th. So the actual, like, the publishing date is June 4th, but the launch is June 7th. It's okay. from 6 to 9. And where's that going to be? It's going to be at um, the CSI Annex. Um, it's also 720 Bathurst. It's just across the street from Central Tech School. Okay. The Real Drick is going to be catering some appetizers. Mm. So, you know. So there's food. There's food. That's all you need to say. <laughs> it's true. You should have started, started with, with that. like there's food. So guys, the launch there will be food there. Everyone's like done. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Sign us up. So and what time does it start again? Six. At six o'clock. Okay. So what are you most excited about, about with this book? Uh, I think like I mentioned before, I'm just really excited for how, you know, people of the diaspora are gonna relate to it and if there's certain passages or certain stories that they really, really enjoy, I wanna hear about it. I just I really wanna hear what speaks to, to people. That definitely makes everything like just worth it. Okay. Yeah. So tell people where they can find you if they want to stay in touch with you, if they want to ask you questions, they want to ask you this. That's not how you spell it. Because <laughs> you know you're going to have your criticizing. That's know. just how life I works. Know. But if they are criticizing you, it means they're noticing you. <laughs> so take it. Where can they reach you? Um, so I have a website, actually. It's uh, ZalikaRebenta.com. I am on Instagram, which is ZalikaRB. And uh, I do have a Twitter that I always forget about. Um, and it's literati167, so that's where they can reach me. Okay. I really want to thank you thank for you. coming in. Thank you for having me. Yeah, honestly, like, I, you realize I didn't have a choice. Right? <laughs> like, the universe was like, remember, the boomerang effect was it's happening true. to me. So, again, guys, get out there. When this book comes out, this is for all of us second-generation Jamaicans. Okay? We need to read this. I'm going to be in here like, yeah, man, that's how you say that. <laughs> that's how you say that word. Yes, I get it. Thank you, guys, for joining us and joining me on the relaunch of In The Now. Next week, we will be back here, 12 o'clock sharp. We'll be prepared this time, we promise. And I want you guys to have a wonderful Friday afternoon. Go Raptors, take care of yourself. Don't walk on any glass bridges. And we will see you next week. Have a wonderful Bye. weekend. <laughs>
Are you retiring smart? Make your home's equity work for you. With your home's equity in our 30 years of experience, the Retire Smart Properties team can help you achieve the quality of life you've always wanted. Our services are 360 degrees. We'll give you advice, take care of staging and selling, and help you find the perfect home and community to transition to. It's time to enjoy the retirement lifestyle you deserve. Visit our website today to learn how you can use your home to retire comfortably. The Retire Smart Properties Team, powered by REMAX West.